In human history, there has been a lot of wars, small and big, long and short. But one war is known as the deadliest war of all, and that's World War I. The amount of people that died in this war compared to the population of the world at that time was insane. 40 million people died because of this war. The soldiers back then were put in a bad situation and we could say being a World War I soldier was probably one of the hardest things in the world. No food, no water, dead corpse with a bunch of disease on them, disgusting rats that eat the dead bodies and spread disease. Explaining this has already made me very scared to be in that situation. But let's go back to 1914 and see what life was like for a World War I soldier. You have to know that in 1914, World War I started. And the countries that were involved was Britain, France, Germany, Ottoman Empire, and Russia. It's good to know that World War I was one of the first wars that had trenches. And obviously, it was to cover up so they can shoot at the enemy from the trenches. Basically, the war was between two armies and they would hold a line between trenches. And in the middle, it was nothing. And it's very famous to call this place No Man's Land. And that basically means no man will stay alive if they enter it because they will be shot instantly. Even though they used trenches way after World War I and the soldier was technically out of danger, but it was a swamp of disease and dirtiness. And you could say most soldiers died because of the condition they were put in rather than the bullets they got shot with. Just like we said, in these trenches, there was a bunch of disease. This is a map of a trench, and they believe this is the best way to resist the enemy. Because if anyone enters no man's land, they will be shot from multiple directions. We talk a lot about the trenches, but we have to say this as well. They will make these trenches at the borders, so the enemy can't move forward anymore. It wasn't because they wanted to gain land. The soldiers in the front line had the worst life. Most of the time, at the bottom, it was full of mud, and you had to walk inside the mud, and that was usually with ripped up boots. As you know, it's northern Europe, the weather is cold, the boots are ripped, there is wet mud underneath you, and you could say, all this cold water and mud made people get trench foot. What we just explained to you guys caused 75,000 British soldiers to lose their foot and that was all because of the conditions of the trench. And there was a lot of disease beside these. Even though there were medics at the trenches, but there were so many injured that they couldn't help most of them. And to put it short is that soldiers would sit in this trench, eat, sleep, fight, go to the bathroom, and eventually die. Everything would happen in these trenches. But another living thing was in these trenches, a disgusting animals that everybody hates, rats. And these creatures killed a lot of soldiers because of the disease they carried. Did you guys see the conditions? It gets worse in 1915. This is the year the German soldiers started to use chemical weapons. Chlorine gas was everywhere. The year 1917 is the year the US entered World War I and they would answer the Germans with chemical weapons as well. You guys know Harry Truman the president that ordered the atomic bomb in Hiroshima. He was a World War I veteran, and it's in his biography that he was responsible for using chemical weapons on the Germans. 
but back then it was normal. The, the Germans started to use it and the Americans answered. In this war, at least 500,000 young soldiers were killed because of chemical weapons. And how would you die with chemical weapons? A slow, painful death. Because they didn't even know what to do with an injured one. Basically, a World War I soldier was doomed. They would either die of diseases, or they would be shot, or they would be attacked by chemical weapons, or they would stay alive and come home. But if they would come back, they would be shell shock. Basically, shell shock is an extreme case of PTSD. And back then, they would say their soul has been demolished. There was a different level of shell shock. And if someone was farther from the battle, they would be less shell shocked. But World War I was one of the worst case scenarios for post traumatic stress disorder. Because in World War II, they kind of learned from what's going on. But it's not like World War II was any better, it was just not as bad as World War I. If you want to say the worst things about World War I, we're going to be here until tomorrow. The soldiers that were shell-shocked, a lot of them couldn't fight anymore and they had to quit. You might not believe it, but in the British Army, 300 of these soldiers were executed for cowardness. What did these soldiers eat in these trenches? Potatoes and weeks old bread. 1916, there was a shortage of flour and the bread was gone and it was only potatoes left. And that is why Europeans have a lot of different ways for cooking potatoes. Because in those years, that's all they had to eat. Most of the time, the soldiers in the trenches had to be standing up and looking out because they could attack all of a sudden. And that is why they had to be looking out all the time. Most of the time, half the soldiers would be standing up for lookout or shooting and the other half were taking a break. And the breaks were going to the bathroom. They would cook or warm up food. They also had playing cards if they were bored. And when the magazine and newspaper would come into the trenches, they would read it and pass it along. Between the magazines and newspapers, there were jokes as well. And that was to keep their spirit up. One of the most interesting things that happened in World War I was on December 24, 1914, Christmas Eve. In those years, one soldier from one trench and the other from the other trench. They enter no man's land. They shake each other's hand and soldiers from both sides come join in the middle and because of Christmas, they don't fight. They don't fight that night, but they go back into the trenches and resume the war the next day. This was the choice of the soldiers. And when the commanders found out what happened, they said never do that again, and nothing like this ever happened again. This was a situation for a World War I soldier, and the frontline soldiers of every country was in a situation like this, and one country wasn't better than the other. This war took four years, and in the end, Germany had lost, the Ottoman Empire collapsed, the communist revolution happened in Russia and the main winners were Britain, US and France. And the entire cost of the war and the entire blame was put on Germany. And they told Germany it was all their fault and they started the war. And you have to pay for everything. A lot of people say what happened to Germany in World War I caused the Nazis to come into power and make themselves ready for World War II. And you guys pretty much know the rest of this.
In World War I, using chemical weapons was very normal and all of the countries did it. Each country was trying to create the most deadly chemical weapon it could use to defeat the enemy. One of the most famous types of chemical weapons is the mustard gas. This gas has nothing to do with mustard that you eat, but when it's released somewhere, it smells like garlic or onions. If you were in a battlefield and you smelt that, your life would not be the same. This gas was discovered by a British by the name of Frederick Guthrie in the year 1860. He didn't have a plan to use this gas in warfare. He was just a chemist that discovered a type of gas. But the people that used this in warfare were the Germans. In World War I, they got the formula for this deadly gas and they continuously used it throughout World War I. When a soldier smells this gas, first of all, his eyes starts to tear and it has a burning sensation and the pain in your eyes rises second by second and it gets so bad that you literally can't see anymore. After your eyes stop working, throughout your body on your skin, different types of scabs appear. This is the first issues that pop up when you sniff this gas. But this is nothing. Your lungs have suffered a lot. Cancer cells are starting to grow. In World War II, nurses would say the people that suffered chemical gases, their bodies were so messed up and cut up that the whole body needed to be bandaged up. Basically, there was not a single part of the body that didn't have a cut. After World War I, they didn't give up. They were looking for ways to make this deadly gas even deadlier. The biggest user of the mustard gas was Nazi Germany in World War II. They obviously used it in World War II, especially on the prisoners they had. The Germans had a set factory to put this gas in different types of shells so they could easily use it during war. The employees of this factory weren't safe from the gas either. A lot of the workers would suffer chemical damage. This gas was so scary that whoever was in the vicinity of the gas would suffer a painful death. First, it would kind of paralyze them, then slowly kill them. When they told the Germans to stop using this type of weapons on other people, they said, what's the point? We're gonna kill them either way. It could be by a bullet or this gas. The first time mustard gas was used, it was in 1917 by the Germans. But it wasn't only the Germans that were using it at that time. It was every country dumping it on each other. But the Germans were a lot better at it and they had more advanced weapons compared to the other countries. But this gas was so bad that it would literally hurt the German soldiers themselves. The people that would launch these weapons, they would be suffering as well. And it's cool to know, the people that designed these chemical weapons, they wouldn't even come close to the battlefield, not even a hundred kilometers from it. But the soldiers were up front shooting all this. Just in World War II alone, 1.3 million soldiers got injured from this gas and died a painful death. And this is not counting the prisoners that died from this mustard gas. When the Germans notice that their soldiers are also suffering from this gas, they try to figure out a better way to use it. And that is why they started experimenting on the prisoners. Who were the prisoners? There were Jews, Russians, Gypsies, French, or any other type of prisoner you can think of. The people that were in these camps, they were treated like lab rats. It didn't even matter to the Nazis that these were humans as well. 
If you've seen our video about the angel of death, you'll know a lot more about this. Some people say that these stories are lies and they came up with it after World War II. But there are a lot of writings that shows this. Because the Germans were very organized and anything they did, they had records of it. They would write it down. There is a lot of filmings they did. And you also have to know this, that Nazis did not believe they were gonna lose ever. And that is why they kept records of everything they did. One of the most experiments the Nazis did on the prisoners, they would give them chemical gas and try experiments on them. So they could see if they can fix them or not. A lot of them would say that the prisoners would beg to let them die or please kill us. They would multiply the pain of these prisoners by 20 because they would try different type of chemicals on their cuts and bruises so they can see what it does. They would inject them with all types of materials. You could tell from the Nazi records that the people that were tested on, none of them gave a positive answer. And after that, they would die in painful ways like infections or literally from pain. From the prisoners that they were tested on, none of them came out alive, except one, an anti-fascist German that was in prison because of political ideas. There were experiments ran on him like the other prisoners, but he stays alive and tells a story about it. And the reason he's alive is that they put a little bit of mustard gas on his arm and they didn't make him smell it or inject it. Hans Cargo says, they dab this a little bit on my arm and immediately around that area, cuts and bruises start to show and there was extreme pain on that area. But his eyes were still good and he didn't breathe it in so he could breathe fine and that is why he stayed alive and after the war he was released. Maybe because he was a German, they let him go. Any experiment the Nazis were doing, they would first try it on a rat then a prisoner. Then they would realize, like for example, vitamin A would fix the bruises of a mice, but the same vitamin makes the cuts on a human way worse. If we want to talk about all the experiments and painful things they did to these prisoners, we could be talking about this for hours. But we have to know this, that after World War I in the year 1925, most of the countries in the world sign that they'll never use chemical weapons in a war. But none of the countries actually listen to it. The Nazis used it in World War II. The Japanese also. If you've seen the video Unit 731, you'll know about this as well. After this, the Americans used it in the Vietnam War. And in the end, Saddam Hussein would use it on the Iranians and his own people. Not only did he use this gas on the Iranian soldiers in the war, but he also used it on civilians. On Sardasht, West Azerbaijan, they used chemical weapons in the city. The civilians would say that it smells like grass and we didn't hate the smell. This is just one story. In the city of Halabche in Iraq, he completely wiped it out with chemical weapons in a way that 5,000 civilians died in one minute and more than 10,000 people were hit with the chemical gas and died a slow painful death. There's a lot of pictures of Halabche and Sardasht and it's extremely sad and disturbing to look at and we can't show it. Saddam Hussein would get these chemical weapons from the Germans and the Germans would later tell the Iranians to send the chemical warfare patients so we can work on them. Kind of like what the Nazis were doing. When we uploaded the video about the Golden Gate and we got to know more about the Great Depression, a few people told me to make a video about the Great Depression. It's the 1920s and the world's economy 
is not that bad. But Germany is having a terrible time because they have just lost World War I and they are forced to pay for all the damages. And that's to every country that was involved. And this is a time where the German marks is basically worthless. And if you want to get one dollar, you have to give a truckload. At this time, a lot of countries are at a bad position. Germany is completely ruined. The Ottoman Empire has collapsed. The entire continent of Europe needs to rebuild. And they're waiting for the paycheck from Germany. And this is in a place where Germany has no money. But in the middle of all this, there is a country that not only did they not lose any money in this war, but they profited off of it. And the economy is booming. And that's the US. Everything is going well for the US until we get to the 24th of October 1929. This day is called Black Thursday. On this day, the New York Stock Exchange basically collapses, nearing zero. And this is the moment the Great Depression began. In the US, just like Europe, their economy crashes and a lot of problems begin for the people. A lot of Americans were upset because this depression was ruining their life and unlike the Europeans, they were not allowed to drink alcohol. It's good to know that in this moment, it's prohibition in America and you couldn't buy alcohol. The only people that were not doing too bad were the people that didn't have any stock or if they had it, they sold it before the crash. The other group of people that were doing well were the mafias, especially the mafia groups in New York and Chicago, the ones that would sell alcohol under the table. And the most famous one is Al Capone, which we've made a video on. At this time, most people in the US were going bankrupt and were doing terribly, but the mafia was getting richer day by day. There were a lot of problems, there were a lot of alcoholics, and the mafia was swimming in cash. They get so rich that businessmen in New York and Chicago start to take loans from these guys. After this took place, most of the cash flow that was coming into the mafia's business was from interest rates from the loans they have given out. We could say in the Great Depression, the mafias got way too powerful, but everybody was hungry and unemployed. What the people did back then was that wake up in the morning, go into the unemployment line, and go home at night hungry. In our video about Golden Gate, we mentioned it. It was the same thing all over the country. Like when they were building a skyscraper in New York, there would be a line downstairs just in case anyone fell, they would have a job now. But this situation is not only in the US and the whole world is suffering. Majority of the people are hungry, unemployed, and they have no hope for the next day. But why did the New York Stock Exchange collapse? Because we mentioned before, in the 1920s, it was only the US that was having a good time. At that time, there were a lot of money in the country, a lot of jobs, everybody had jobs, and everybody had money. And where did they put their money? Into the stock exchange. All the graphs were moving up day by day. The banks gave out loans like it grew on trees. A lot of people would take loans just to buy stocks. The loans had insane interest rates as well. By doing this, the banks gave out too many loans to regular people and they would use the money to pay the loans they had gotten earlier. And loan on top of loan, they owed money. This situation put the money out of the banks and put it into the stock market. A lot of rich people realize that the banks are gonna collapse after this and the stock market is filling up like a bubble and it's about to burst. And that is why they sold all their shares. After everything was sold, something like Black Thursday happened. When you look at this situation closely, the rich got way richer and the poor lost everything. Because they didn't know that they have to sell the stocks before it crashes completely. Either way, everybody's investment went to zero. 
So it's the same thing for the US. You wake up to get a piece of bread and go home hungry. With all that, the US situation was better than the entire world. Why? Because the US didn't owe money to anyone like Europe did. And that's because Europe loaned billions of dollars during World War I from the US and they would have to pay that debt. And the worst one was Germany. They damaged Germany so bad that between all these people, someone like Adolf Hitler had rised up and a regime like the Nazi regime was formed. They put so much pressure on the German people for more than 10 years that they literally hated everybody. And that is exactly why Hitler's speech had a huge impact on the people. Hitler was a racist that had charisma and he spoke in a way that the people trusted him. And that's why in January 1933, the Nazi regime had control over Germany and the Nazis actually did fix the economy for Germany. And this is in a place where the world's economy is terrible. And that's why on the other hand, whatever bad thing the Nazi regime did, the people would just close their eyes and sweep it under the rug. Because before these guys showed up, this is how the country looked like. They put so much pressure on the German government and the people after World War I that every racist or terrible thing these guys said, the people didn't care. The Nazis would blame the Jewish people, the Russian people, the British, the US, the Gypsy. And with these speeches, he made the German people actually hate them. After this, Germany's economy starts booming, but the entire world is still struggling. At the end of the 1930s, when World War II begins, the US economy is picking back up. But Europe was struggling for 10 years, and they have another war in their front lawn again. And this chaos is going to continue for six more years. The Europeans were the global superpower for hundreds of years. But these two world wars made that power go to the US and a little bit to the Soviets. And the Europeans were ranked down to the second superpower. But what happened to the Middle East in this era? Iran, Afghanistan, Iraq, or the other country? As you know, in 1917 in Iran, there was a form of a Holocaust where millions of people starved to death. And that's because the British army would buy all the foods and give none to the Iranian people. So a lot of people starved to death. In Iran after World War I, in 1924, Ahmad Shah basically runs away from Iran and Reza Shah is the new king. Reza Shah was only the king for 16 years, but he very quickly started to modernize Iran, something the Qajars would not do. And unfortunately, in 1941, the British and the Russians arrested Reza Shah and put his son in charge. In 1933 in Afghanistan, Mohammad Zahir Shah was the new king of Afghanistan. Zahir Shah, just like Reza Shah, began to modernize Afghanistan. But what was happening in Tajikistan? Tajikistan was a part of the Soviet Union and they were behind the borders of the Iron Curtain. This is a time where the Ottoman Empire has collapsed and a bunch of fake countries are created west of Iran. Countries like Iraq, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Emirates, Oman, Palestine, Oman, Syria, Lebanon, all of them. When the world was burning, the Middle East was trying to modernize. Mohammad Zahir Shah in Afghanistan, Reza Shah in Iran, and Ataturk in Turkey. The way they sent messages and received messages in World War II was in a code form. But that's obvious. At war, you can't really say what you're gonna do. But spies, different systems, 
and mistakes made by the soldiers would cause a lot of operations to get messed up because of it. But the Germans were the best at this, and that was because of the Enigma machine. At first, it looks like a typewriter, but this small machine was one of the biggest enemies to the Allies, and the Enigma machine allows Germans to win a lot of battles. The way the machine works is that someone gets a code, and they use the machine to enter it, and the machine would turn the code into a message. The Enigma machine had the combination of having 159 quintillion different outcomes. The Germans would believe nobody could break the Enigma code. And the simple meaning of that is, nobody could get our messages. And that is why any useful information the Germans wanted to pass around, they would use the Enigma machine. It's good to know that the Enigma machine was designed after World War I by the Germans. At first, it was much simpler than it was after. And that is why in the 1930s, the Germans made the machine more complicated and better. Either way, World War II starts, and with the help of this machine, the Germans get a lot of land in Europe. You could say the Enigma machine was more effective than a lot of different weapons. While all of this is happening, the Allies are looking for a way to break the Enigma code and read the messages. You guys should know Alan Turing, a very famous mathematician that we talked about a lot. And also a lot of people believe that the first computer design was by Alan Turing. In the year 1939, when England declared war on Germany, the British government hired Alan Turing to figure out the Enigma machine. You could say he tried to figure it out, but he never got anywhere, and that is why he told them it's not possible. They asked him, what should we do? He says the only way we can crack it is to design a machine just like Enigma. He designed a machine and made it, and he named it Bomb. The machine he'd made was not hand-operated, and it was automatic. But the problem was, it wasn't one answer. It had multiple answer when it figured it out. And the reason was, it was automatic, so it had a few different answers. Either way, this was a life-saving machine for the Allies. In a way that you could say, it opened the eyes and ears of the Allies. And they slowly realized what actually is happening. The first time that Alan Turing's machine actually gave an answer, it was on April 1940. Even though it was an old code, it still got the answer. And the answer was the operation of a German U-boat for one week. The first time that his machine actually gave a proper answer for an attack was on May 1941. He figured out on what day exactly, in what place in the Atlantic Ocean, a German U-boat was gonna be at. And that allowed them to surround the U-boat. The machine gave such exact coordinates that they were able to surround the U-boat. And that allowed them to easily take over the U-boat as well. Getting this U-boat allowed the British Army to get an Enigma machine in their hands. And getting this machine allowed Alan Turing to make his machine bomb better. And that's when the Allies started to actually manufacture the bomb machine. So they can send it everywhere and all the Allies have access to it. And you could say until the end of the war, there was 155 bomb machines. This is a message that the Enigma machine has to solve. Whatever you do, you can't figure out what the hell it's talking about. In the year 1942, the Germans realized that the Enigma is slacking, and that is why they added the fourth rotor to the machine. And that means if it was a three-letter code, now it's four. This made Alan Turing's job a lot harder, and he was forced to change the machine. 
But Alan Turing had a different idea in mind. He said we don't need a new machine. He just said we could compare the old codes to the new codes because we have so many old codes that we can figure out what the new ones mean. This got to a point where the British army could solve a Nazi code every two minutes. What Alan Turing was doing for the British army was huge and he worked for intelligence and he had nothing to do with the actual army and it was made in a way that the army didn't know how these codes were being solved. It was so top secret that nobody could figure out that Alan Turing and this is the way they're figuring it out. So the spies could not figure out what's happening. Either way, Alan Turing's project made allies win a lot of battles. Another useful thing the bomb machine did was to help the allies destroy the Bismarck destroyer. Alan Turing modified the bomb machine in a way that until 1945 at the end of the war, every Nazi message was being detected and decoded. We could say Alan Turing is one of the most important persons that helped the Allies. And you could say he did a lot more than an army. The reason the British designed this machine for the Enigma was because of Poland. Before the Nazis invaded Poland, Poland sent a message to the British government that the Germans have a machine like this called the Enigma. And if the Polish didn't let them know, the British government wouldn't know what to do. Either way, the British government said that Alan Turing is a hero. But that's until 1952, and that's when the war is completely over. Around that year, Alan Turing was arrested with a few homosexuals, something that was extremely illegal back then. In those days, they would send homosexuals in a type of asylum so they could basically get cured because they believed that homosexuality was a choice and not genetic. And that's when Alan Turing committed suicide at the age of 41. And you could say not a lot of people were sad about it. And that's until 60 years later in the year 2012, the British government announced that we've made a mistake and we shouldn't have treated Alan Turing, a war hero like this. One man can't do a lot in a war, but he can design a machine and change the whole outcome of the war. If you have any idea the tools humans make to destroy each other, and some of them actually have been made, your mind might explode. Do you see this? This is a cannon. It's a cannon that has a 800 millimeter barrel, and that means it had 80 centimeter rounds. There was two different rounds. One of them weighed 4,800 kilograms and a bigger one that weighed 7,100 kilograms. I don't know what they were trying to attack with this thing. It had a height of 11 and a half meters. That's around a five story building. It weighed around 1,350 tons. You know what that means? It's the same weight as 38 18 wheelers filled up to the maximum. To transport this beast, it was made on top of railroad tracks. The barrel had a length of 32 and a half meters. The name of the biggest cannon in history is Schwerer Gustav, and it basically means heavy Gustav. Hitler ordered this weapon to destroy the Magino line. The Magino line was a way of France defending themselves against Germany. It was basically a bunch of reinforced walls with weapons inside them. This cannon was built, but outside of this cannon, Germany never attacked through the Magino line. They took over France from Belgium, and that is why the cannon wasn't used for that part. 
But since it was built before the war, it was designed to fire at the Maginot line from very far away. And it was meant to destroy 7 meters of reinforced concrete. Do you know what 7 meters of concrete means? That means it has the same strength as a steel plate that's 1 meter in thickness. Even though it was built for the Maginot line, throughout the war it was attacking the Allies. But the Germans wanted to attack the Soviets in Sebastopol, Crimea, the same place that Ukraine and Russia have a problem with. But at that time, it's 1942. In 1942, the Germans brought this cannon to Crimea. And the reason it took so long was because moving this thing was a pain. The rails could not handle the weight of this thing. That is why the Germans had to reinforce the rails before it got on top. And for it to be safe in Crimea, they built a giant tunnel for it. So when they don't need it, they could put it inside the tunnel so the Allies could not attack it. You might not believe it, but this cannon was like a factory because it had 500 workers and most of them were engineers and technicians and they had to work together to have this weapon operate with no problem. We get to June 2nd, 1942, where this cannon is in Crimea and the workers have completely gotten it ready to fire. We said it had two different rounds. The small one was 4,800 kilograms. And when it fired, it got out there at the speed of 820 meters per second. And it traveled for 48 kilometers. Just imagine a five ton weight launched for 48 kilometers. Wherever these things landed, it would create a ditch nine meters deep. It basically destroyed a nine meter diameter of ground. The bigger round, which had a weight of more than 7 tons, it was meant to destroy reinforced concrete walls. When this was launched by the Gustav, it had a speed of 720 meters per second, and it would travel for 37 kilometers. One of the most famous places this thing has attacked in Crimea, it was a storage of the Soviet army, and it was called the White Cliffs. Basically, the Gustav attacks it, and with one bullet, it destroys the whole entire place, and their storage was completely demolished. When all 500 workers did their job correctly, this cannon would fire every 45 minutes. In one month time, Gustav shot 300 rounds, and all this firing kind of destroyed the main barrel, and it needed to be exchanged. But proof shows that this barrel was never replaced. Because the Nazis calculated the cost to rebuild this thing and to operate it, it's not worth it anymore, and that is why they kind of retired it. After 1942, the technology moved towards missiles. And they thought, instead of spending money on cannons, let's build missiles. When this thing was destroyed, there was no more new, until we get to 1945. The war is over, and the Nazis have been defeated. A destroyed Gustav was found in Grafen War. They don't know if they destroyed it for recycling or they didn't want anyone to know how it was built. But in the Krupp AG company that was the builder of Gustav Cannon, giant barrels have been found there. They might have had an idea to rebuild it. But just like we said, the armies around the world moved towards missiles. 
But Saddam Hussein had another idea. Even though he had ballistic missiles from the Soviet Union and he attacked Iran constantly, but he was still looking for a cannon that was a lot cheaper than missiles. The name of this project was called Project Babylon. It was planned to fire into space and just like a ballistic missiles, come back into Earth. These cannons were designed at 2100 tons. The barrel was 156 meters and it had a diameter of 1 meter, so 1000 millimeter rounds. This is the same time that Saddam is in a war with Iran. But the project was never finished and after the Iran war, he attacked Kuwait. And after that war, the United Nations basically came and stopped the project. We all know that war is a bad thing, and when a war starts, there's always bad things that come with it. Some things happen that when you compare them to the war, the war is nothing. If you see the video about Joseph Mengele, it's one of those things. A disaster that happened in World War II. A war that changed the world. It wasn't only the Nazis. In the same war, there was a place on the other side of the world. Japan's Unit 731. In World War II, Japan was a superpower and it controlled the eastern part of Asia. Japan was part of the Axis powers that fought the Allies. In that time, east of China, Philippines, Korea, and parts of Russia were in Japan's hands. So in that time, the eastern part of China was in Japan's hand. And Unit 731 was in today's China. Unit 731 was kind of like a laboratory, and they did chemical and biological testing. If you visit laboratories all around the world, in all of those labs, all the testing is done on mice. But in Unit 731, exactly like Auschwitz, the experiments were all done on humans. You have to know that Unit 731 was pretty much a prison. A prison that had laboratories and in a span of five years, meaning from 1940 to 1945, 400,000 people were killed. But between these 400,000 people, 3,000 people were chosen to be experimented on. Most of these people were Chinese and there were some Koreans, Mongols and Russians. We are not sure how they picked the people and why these 3,000 people were chosen from the other ones. One of the experiments was experimenting in the cold, an experiment Joseph Mengele was trying at the same time. Because the biggest problem for the soldiers at that time were the cold and they wanted to figure out a way to help the soldiers survive in the winter. Outside of this prison was extremely cold. They would walk the person outside and they would hold him until he starts freezing and you start seeing frostbite. When he got to that point, they would bring him inside so the doctors can run experiments on the body. The people that were released from this prison would explain they would take the people outside in the freezing cold and since they wanted them to freeze faster, they would pour freezing water on top of them. And when they were freezing, one of the soldiers would have a stick and then he would proceed to hit the prisoner with it. And the reason for that was, if it made a louder noise than a human body, it's time to go inside. The person that they would take inside was pretty much dead, but they wanted to try other things to bring him back to life and figure out how you can make a person unfreeze. 
they tried all types of experiments on these freezing prisoners. Sometimes they would pour warm water on top of them. There was also boiling water used on top of them as well. Some of these people would be chosen to get a disease. They would inject some things to force them to get sick. When they would get sick, they would go to the surgery room. Without any anesthesia or painkillers, they would open up the patient. They just wanted to know what this disease does inside the body. When they open up the person's body, they would most likely die from pain. Another test they did in Unit 731 was testing sicknesses. For this test, they needed a bunch of people to have this sickness. And that is why the people inside the prison weren't enough for this experiment. They would make disease-filled liquids, put them in planes, and go spray on type of Chinese towns. Then, they would look at the town and see what's going on. They would see what this sickness is doing, and sometimes they would even take some subjects from the town to Unit 731. The reason they did this was to see if it's worth it to try bigger cities and to try it on their biggest enemies, mostly the United States. They wanted to put disease-filled liquid inside of balloons and fly it over the United States. But let's get back to Unit 731. Japanese people have this attitude that everything has to be well done. And that is why they wanted to make the best weapons as well. And for testing these weapons, they would use these poor prisoners. They would use different types of weapons in different ranges to see which one is more effective. They would test different grenades from different distances as well. They would release gas on prisoners as well to see which one is more deadly. They wanted to see from what distance this gas is deadly. Or they wanted to see what a human does inside a pressure chamber. They would put people inside pressure chambers and when they go in there, in the first couple seconds, their eyes would pop out. Then they would die. The interesting part is, some of the colleges that had medical students would send these students to Unit 731 to do tests on human subjects. One of the students came clean about this place. They told them, if you want to get a medical degree, you have to go to China and do tests on humans. They would give some people syphilis and then they would bring another prisoner and make them have sex. They wanted to see how syphilis is transferred. They would bring a man with syphilis and have a woman right there as well. And they would make him make the female pregnant. And the reason was they wanted to see if the baby comes out with syphilis. A lot of babies were born in this laboratory, but no babies left here alive. Because when a baby was born, they for sure had experiments for them. Experiments that explaining them is disturbing. Japan themselves later confessed that they did more experiments than people knew. The things we told you in the beginning, they didn't deny any of them. And they added four more things they did over there. One of the tests were exposing people to radiation, meaning they would send radioactive waves to see what happens. Another experiment was that they would replace human blood with animal blood, and they wanted to see what happens to the person. Another one, they would put salty seawater inside a human body. And last but not least, they said they would burn people alive to see what happens. K-1 
Can you believe it? How bad some people are? There's a reason that Chinese people and Koreans are still mad at Japan, and they ask them to apologize for what they did. The Germans apologize for everything the Nazis did, but the Japanese haven't apologized to anybody. Even to the Chinese, which they did the most damage to. And worst of all, they acknowledge the people that did all this, and look at them as heroes. It's World War II, and you're a Japanese pilot, and you're waiting to receive an order on what to do. Except you, there are other pilots waiting for an order as well. All of a sudden, the door opens and your commanding officer confronts you. And he tells you guys, we've received the letter that came from the emperor. And you have to answer that are you willing to give your life for your country? These pilots had three options. You could say no, you could say okay, or you could say absolutely. In Japanese culture, saying no to a question like this is very embarrassing. Because if you say no, no one will respect you. No one would say okay either, because that was also very embarrassing for the pilot. So everybody would proudly say absolutely. When you said absolutely, you basically signed your life away. There was no going home and saying goodbye to your family. You have to go see what the order is and get ready for it. Before starting, they would go to train these pilots. After that lesson, these pilots would become a kamikaze, something like a suicide bomber. When they were ready next to their planes, the commanding officers tells its soldiers to get ready because the emperor is coming to meet them. This was very effective for the kamikazes because in Japan, the emperor was seen as a god. The emperor would get off the horse and he would tell the kamikaze that this was my request and you're dying for your country. The Emperor's plan was very weird, because it's weird that you fill up an airplane with all types of explosives, send some of your best soldiers, and tell them to go kill themselves. Everything is ready, and the airplanes are ready to go. But what do you think was told during the training? What did they tell them? In the end, they told them, don't be scared of anything. Don't think about your family at all. Only think about Japan because it's your country. And there's nothing more important for a human to give their lives for their country. And they also told them, if you go there and your mission fails, and all of a sudden you come back, it's better if you don't come back because you will be seen as a scared soldier. Before the death flight, they would have to do something else as well. They had to write a letter to their families and write them whatever they wanted to tell them. But they would tell them that this letter will go to your family after your death. Whoever wrote their letter, they would give the letter to their commander and go towards their airplane. Just like the suicide bombers today that have explosives wrapped around them, the Japanese would fill up the fighter with explosives. They would fill it up in a way that the only space left was for the pilot. They would also fill up the tank of the airplane so the explosion is much bigger. When the kamikazes get to their plane, they see, wow, all the airplanes are old and beat up because the worst airplanes were used to do a job like this. The airplanes back then would start up by spinning the impeller. Every kamikaze would look at their plane and get inside. Then he would tell the mechanic to let her rip and start it. Some airplanes wouldn't even start up because it was the worst airplanes left. 
The pilot that would sit behind this airplane, first of all, he was gonna go commit suicide. Second of all, he had no confidence in the airplane that it's even gonna fly in the sky. And that is why the kamikazes themselves were under a lot of pressure and stress. Some of the airplanes that would not start, they would forcefully start them in a way that the engine was literally smoking. But the mechanics would tell them, it's all good, just fly away. Then the pilot would fly off. Where did these guys have to go? They had to go onto the Pacific Ocean, then get to US Navy ships and crash themselves into them. Even though the targets were close to Japan, but the planes were so bad that some of them literally crashed into the ocean before they got to the target. When they got to the group of Navy ships, they would see them from afar. Then their heart would start to beat faster. Just like the pilots were thought, only think about Japan and you're killing yourself for your country. At first, when the airplanes were approaching the Navy ships, they didn't know that they're gonna go full-blown kamikaze into them. And they thought they're gonna come and drop bombs. And that's why the ships started shooting at them before they got closer. It was World War II and the US Navy was right next to Japan. And that is why they were ready for anything. When the kamikaze would get close, the US airplanes would lift off and they would try to go behind them to shoot them out. And on the other side, the ship is non-stop firing at these kamikazes. This shows us that for a kamikaze to actually hit a target, it was extremely difficult. But when a plane actually was successful in hitting a ship, the chances of that ship sinking was very high. It was a maniacal all-out effort to smash our sea power. Isolate our... Since the kamikazes could not return home and they're going to die, they would give it their all to hit their target. They would say that whenever they're above the ship, they would turn the airplane handle all the way down and fly into their target like a missile. Also, some of them would fly close to the ocean, so the anti-aircraft couldn't see them very well to shoot them out. This was a life of a kamikaze. It's cool to know that there were 2,800 kamikazes, so they lift 2,800 kamikazes towards US ships. These guys successfully sink 34 US ships, damage 368 of them, and kill 4,900 American soldiers. The kamikazes were mostly used in the years 1944 to 1945, and after that, the war obviously ended. The Americans do not like what these guys did. The Japanese are proud at what they did in Unit 731, so obviously they respect their kamikazes. But the pride in these kamikazes is very interesting. In the end, 4,000 pilots lifted off to do what a kamikaze does. Out of the 4,000, 1,200 of them crashed into the ocean before they got to the target. A lot of people say what the Japanese did with this was very stupid because they killed 4,000 of their good soldiers for no reason and they didn't get much in return. What do you guys think? Is what they did right or wrong? Please comment.
When we look at the history of Germany in World War II, it's very surprising because in such a short period of time, they achieved a lot. Most of these findings was from doing evil activities like Joseph Mengele, but their industry was actually very advanced. Today, we want to look at one of these technology, the Horton Ho 229, an insane idea of an aircraft. The radar could not detect it whatsoever. It was the fastest plane at its time and it could go to the other side of the pond without refueling. The Germans were really trying their hardest to finish this early, and that's for only one thing, to attack New York City. The official name of this airplane was the Ho-229, but the nickname was the American Bomber. And what they meant was that this bomber is designed specifically for the United States. A plane like this was originally designed in the early 1930s, way before World War II was even an idea. Even though there was no war yet, but Hitler knew that the United States was one of the main enemies, and that is why they were always looking for tools to attack the Americans, and he always believed that they have to attack the US. In 1937, the Germans designed a plane called the ME-264 and they believed it could easily fly to the United States. In the year 1938, the commander of the Nazi Air Force by the name of Hermann Göring said, We are designing weapons that could get to the other side of the pond, and that means the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. What he was trying to do was threat the US, but he never used the US name. This is in a way where World War II has not begun yet. Year after year passes and World War II has started, but ME-264, even though it could fly to the United States, but it couldn't carry anything with it, so it had to fly alone, and at that point, there was no reason to send it there. We get to the year 1944, the Russians are moving forward towards Germany, but the Germans believe even if the war is at a loss, we need to attack New York with this aircraft. The Nazi Air Force told its workers that we need an aircraft that could go 11,000 kilometers and it could carry 4,000 kilograms worth of bomb. They needed 11,000 kilometers so it would fly from Berlin all the way to America and back without refueling. But aircraft engineers in Germany would say, a design like this is impossible. There has to be a stop for refueling. And they would choose the Azure Island in the middle of the Atlantic. And they said, if they can refuel in this island, it's possible. In the middle of all this, there were two brothers that considered themselves aircraft engineers, and they're called the Horton brothers. They had a design that was meant for a bomber exactly like this, and with all their calculations, this bomber can do whatever the army needs. Just like we said, these two designed this aircraft from the 1930s, and at that time, it seemed unbelievable that such thing could be built because there was a plan to put six jet engines on there. And at this time, the most advanced planes had impellers. This design of an aircraft is called a flying wing. And what it means is that the entire aircraft is a wing and there's no actual body or tube. And because of this design, the Horton brothers believe that this plane will use 30% less fuel than an ordinary plane. And they believe the most important thing about this plane is that it will not be seen on the radars. And that's mostly because of the design. It's good to know that what the Horton brothers said about radars was one of the first times they mentioned this. Because before then, there was no anti-radar aircraft. This was one of the final designs the Horton brothers drew. 
They first named it the Horton 18. The width was about 40 meters and the length was about 19 meters. And if you count the whole plane, it's about 150 square meters. Look at this plane. It doesn't seem like it belongs to the 40s. If someone saw this thing back in the day, they'll probably think it's a UFO. Even if you see this fly over your head, it's extremely insane. Imagine you saw it in 1944. The normal speed of the Ho 229 was about 750 kilometers an hour, but it had a top speed of 900 kilometers an hour, and that made it the fastest aircraft at that time. They never actually got to use this plane like that. But when the Horton brothers were building this plane, they said it could easily go to New York, bomb and come back. There were two guns up front on this plane and it also had a rear gun. And anyone that wanted to attack this plane, it had weapons to counter attack. Technology really leads to a design that doesn't make sense and it's insane. And you might not believe it, the chassis of this aircraft was made from wood. And that was another reason why you could not see it on the radar. On February of 1945, this plane was pretty much finished and they wanted to test it. There's only two months left until the war is over, but the Germans would not let this project go whatsoever, even though they were losing almost every battle on the eastern and western front. This plane was about to get done and they still haven't tested yet. The Horton brothers were very good designers, but I wouldn't call them master engineer. And that is why aircraft engineers will always critique their work and always tell them that your design will never actually work in the real world. The engineers would say that if you want this thing to actually fly, you need to add a wing like this to it. The brothers would disagree and tell them that this brings the weight up and you can't do it anymore. But the brothers still went at it and tried to fix the issues. They said, we're gonna make the engines from six to two engine and make it a little bit smaller. They took the same aircraft and modified it and made it two jet engine. They say they tested this aircraft, but it was too late because the allies were inside Berlin and the Germans decided to scrap the plane so nobody gets it. There are pictures of this aircraft flying, but we're not sure if it's real or not. It's good to know that the Horton brothers successfully changed this aircraft in under two months. They tested it, but they never used it. Because in April 1945, Berlin had fallen and that's two months after they started to redesign the aircraft. All the designs and writings of this aircraft were in the Americans hands now and the US even has a piece of this aircraft and they realized that the Germans had actually built three of these aircrafts and one of these were destroyed. They don't know what happened with the other one but one of them was in pieces and the Americans had it. And right now this piece is in a museum in Washington DC and you could go and see it. When the Americans reviewed the design of this aircraft, they wouldn't believe it. These two brothers were considered geniuses at that time. There could have been fear in their eyes because they believed that if they did not defeat the Germans, this thing would attack New York. It's good to know that the Horton brothers designed the same style aircraft for a passenger one, but obviously something like this would never work because it would be too complicated and expensive. So what happened to these Horton brothers? One of them called Raymar Horton ran away to Argentina and they don't know much about him. But one of the brothers by the name of Walter Horton stayed in Germany and he basically started helping the West. This style of an aircraft came alive in the 1970s when the Americans were trying to design a bomber with the same design. The US started in 1970s and by the year 1989 they had done it and they built the B-2 stealth bomber and this is one of the most expensive aircrafts in history.
Walter Horton was alive until 1998 and he lived in West Germany. Even though he was part of the Nazi regime, he helped the Westerners and that is why they pardoned him. And he eventually died in Germany. Even though the Nazis were not in power for a long time, but they brought a lot of technology in this world. And one of the most insane things they figured out was rocket and missile technology. A lot of people believe that if the US did not capture Nazi scientists, they could have not gone to the moon. But let's be honest, it would have taken a long time to figure out how rockets work. Forget about satellites and moon landing. In terms of medicine, the Nazis did a lot of experiments. As you know, the Axis powers were the Germans and the Japanese mainly. And they did a lot of experiments in terms of medicine at that time. But in extremely horrifying types of tests. If you've seen our video about Japan's Unit 731 or Joseph Mengele, Angel of Death, you should really check them out and see what type of experiments these people were running. 